This is the second studio hosted by the architecture and design office fame. My name is David Lee, and with me is Marina Bordarone. This week, our guest is Alejandro Zara Polo. Alejandro is... I'm close. I'm close. Yeah, it's close you, yeah, yeah maybe. Uh, Alejandro is a Spanish architect. He's also the founder of AZPML, an architecture office based in London, and he was the former dean at Princeton University. Yeah, and if you're an architect and you're involved in the academic space or you're a teacher, educator, anything like that, you probably know who we're talking about and who Alejandro is. Um, he's well known for uh, his him, him teaching and being the dean at Princeton, but also um, his office, and he has done some incredible work as well, most notably um, the Yokohama Terminal, which yeah. is how I was first introduced to, to him you know, years ago when the project was done. Um, with Alejandro, we talk about his story. Uh, his early interest in architecture, him studying architecture in Madrid, I believe it was, at a polytechnic university, the differences in education between what he experienced in a lot of other uh, yeah. colleges. And then we go through, right, the places he worked, uh, what it was like starting his own office, what it was like winning that, that terminal project and how it changed things for him. And of course, his time at Princeton as the dean and then teaching at Princeton. So I think uh, he has a lot of very interesting things to say. This conversation went past our usual two hour mark. We went to two and a half hours. And despite it lasting for two and a half hours, we still managed to run out of time with him. Um, so I think that at the end, things got really interesting, but we were like late to a meeting. <laughs> so we had to chop it. So he'll probably be on the show again to continue the chat. Yeah, I think so. It was uh, very interesting. And he was very open to yeah. talk about maybe the things that you know, you've, you've read about. Yes, definitely. I hope you guys enjoy it. Let us know what you think sponsors. Designers and architects, if you're looking for a powerful real-time visualization and VR tool, then check out Enscape. Enscape is super easy to use because it's a plugin and not a standalone application, which means you can directly work in your SketchUp, ARCHICAD, Rhino, Vectorworks, or Revit model. In fact, it only takes a couple of clicks from installation to creating your first rendering. Enscape does realistic renderings, 360-degree panoramas and videos, and virtual reality environments. We use Enscape in our office, we love it, and we think you will too. So click the Enscape 3D link in our show notes to learn more. Second Studio Podcast is made possible by the support from Autodesk. Autodesk has been part of the design conversation since 1982, providing the tools that helps architects around the globe imagine and create beautifully designed, memorable buildings that people love and admire. Autodesk supports the work of the Second Studio, bringing the architecture community together, sparking curiosity, and leading vibrant interviews with the industry's visionaries and thought leaders. The Second Studio works hard to carry the architecture conversation forward, and Autodesk is proud to contribute to this podcast. You can learn more about Autodesk by clicking the link in the episode notes. This is the second studio with myself, Marina, and our guest, Alejandro. Here we go. I was born in Madrid, Spain, <clears throat> and I grew up there until I was uh, basically my first degree <clears throat> was from the School of Architecture in, in Madrid in 1988. And uh, yes, uh, I was interested in architecture since I was. Um, a kid. I mean, I was interested in other things also, but um, I guess uh, I was interested in, in, in on one side in the arts and uh, the sciences, and and so somehow <clears throat> at the time, um, you know, architects were a very well respected profession in Spain and. Mm -hmm. uh, my parents re really didn't want me to become an artist. <laughs> 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 so architecture was a good, uh, a good, basically a good um, place uh, to, in, in that conversation. And, and, but anyway, I was, I was interested in, in buildings since I was uh, little. Uh, so yes, there was some sort of <clears throat> long um, story behind the choice. Were any of your parents architects or designers? Did you have any of that in no. within the family? No, no, zero, <clears throat> zero. My parents were my my father was a kind of scientist and or uh, and my mother was a a literature professor, so <laughs> it was nothing to do with with architecture whatsoever. And nobody in the family, uh, in the white family, was ever involved with architecture. <laughs> Interesting. Or, or construction. <laughs> I see. Gotcha. Gotcha. So what are the perceptions that you had 
what, like, what do people think architects are like, or what did you think an architect did when you were a kid? Because in the United States, or at least for me specifically, I thought an architect, I mean, I never really thought about it, but I would have presumed that an architect drew doors and windows and bathrooms, which on paper sounds utterly boring. And as a kid, I didn't want to do that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, back back then in Spain, um, uh, architects were, I mean, it was... It was uh, the 70s or the 80s when I was <clears throat> basically a, a, a kid. And, and back then, there was a, a lot of development in the country. And therefore, architects were, first of all, making a lot of money, but also um, not just doing door schedules, but uh, but uh, making large buildings mm -hmm. or large residential complexes and things like that. So they were really perceived uh, uh, as as uh, important people uh, <clears throat> plus I, I think it's slightly different from the states uh, in general in Europe uh, particularly in places like Spain or Italy where where there is a very long uh, um, history of cities and there is a very substantial, capital that has been accumulated in <clears throat> in cities that there is a certain public perception that the role of architects is is important because architects sh shape uh, shape cities and mm -hmm. and cities are where people live uh, back th back back there i mean in in uh, uh, now there are more suburbs, so maybe in, in Northern Europe there are more suburbs, but but um, Southern Europe is very much um, based on dense urban settlements. So the way the the I mean, I mean and, and that it's a little bit more complex than just organizing a suburb, which is basically a road with terminals which are right, right, right. homes uh, uh, so uh, more dense settlements that require a little bit more thinking and therefore and that's what architects do and that's why i i believe that there is a a little bit more awareness that yeah. uh, that, is, that is a common good and that uh, there are some people that um, <clears throat> are doing that and and it's important uh, for everybody to that this is done <clears throat> with with a certain level of uh, skill, uh, so I, I I think in in Southern Europe that uh, consciousness is uh, perhaps more acute than than in other places in the world. Mm. I would say. Yeah. I mean, maybe 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 in the in Northern Europe a little bit less, uh, and I think in the States or, or in Asia. Mm, in Asia now, the, the, there is that consciousness because obviously people live in very dense urban mm -hmm. environment. But uh, historically, uh, I think Southern Europe, because of the tradition of um, dense settlements, is uh, I think that awareness is perhaps more acute. Yeah, th that makes sense. And and from my from what I've heard from many people and whatever from what I've seen for talking about the United States versus uh, Europe or Southern Europe specifically, generally, uh, I would agree. There's there's not it's an odd thing in the U.S. how architects are perceived, but that's a whole conversation. So um, your kid architecture seems to be the path you apply yeah. to school um, when you got accepted and you started university or college. Yeah. Was there anything about the architectural education that surprised you? Did you go in <laughs> thinking it was going to be more technical than it ended up being, more conceptual, more something well, else? In, in Spain back then, it was very technical. I mean, it was so technical that, I mean, basically, the School of Architecture is part of the Polytechnic uh, School and the Polytechnic University. And, yeah. and so it is designed, it, it, it was a very long uh, career. <laughs> And it was actually very difficult. Uh, uh, the, the, the whole polytechnic model in, in, in Spain, which is basically copied from the French, <clears throat> um, it, it was based, uh, I mean, I don't know whether the French do that, but in, 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 in Spain, um, you were supposed to be able to 
swap to any other engineering after the third year. So basically the three first years, all you did was integral calculus, algebra. <laughs> what? Uh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was like uh, training for for an engineer for it, yeah. uh, <clears throat> and um, and it was six years when I did it. Plus, uh, and basically, uh, you you had to do do a lot of uh, maths and and geometry and things like that. <clears throat> and it took six years, and then you had to do thesis. Um, but on average, when I was there. Uh, people took approximately 12 years to wow. finish <laughs> Wait. Because, because there was it was it was actually very difficult and and i mean people didn't pass very often <laughs> so unlike, unlike what happens now in the u.s where everybody passes and everyone anyway. gets an a yeah. it's an a or b or gets, exactly. maybe a b minus i yeah. complain exactly. about that all the time yeah. i'm like yeah it doesn't really mean that you're good you know no it doesn't <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> So basically, uh, the the default condition is that you fail. Basically, and yeah. uh, <clears throat> for example, there was one uh, one subject which was. Uh, I mean, it was also huge. I mean, the, the school of architecture. The, the year I I started, I think we were a thousand eight hundred new people. Wow! Well. And, and the school, the whole school was like seven thousand. It was one of these massified European schools which uh -huh. <clears throat> was pretty good in terms of you know uh, i mean you basically train by hitting your head against the the wall because nobody <clears throat> gave a damn about what you were whether you were learning something or not they would just see what you did in the exam and fail you or pass you and uh, <clears throat> and so one there was one uh, one so, no, sorry, I said 1,800. No, it wasn't 1,800. It was something like 700 new students per year. Okay. That's still massive. And, uh, but, but this, this subject, was, which was uh, 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 descriptive geometry, it was the, 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 the title, had like, a, like, a, like an 1,800 people uh, in the list. Uh, and approximately 50 people passed every year. So you can imagine the backlog was incredible. Oh. Incredible. F 50, five, uh, zero. 50, five, zero. Yeah. yeah. Out of 1,800. So we were 1,800. And I, I actually liked the, the subject and passed. And, uh, and we were 50 people that passed that year <clears throat> out of 1,800. So it, it was very selective and very brutal. But on the whole, and and I think <clears throat> very useless because mm -hmm. I mean basically this was a, 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 a national university and so to spend uh, ten years of people's life uh, trying to pass a degree I think is uh, is a, as an, an insane waste of resources. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but then. You know, if you went through the system, you would come out uh, like a kind of pretty tough. <laughs> I was going to say, I was exactly. gonna say that probably made you like super resilient yeah. afterwards. Ex right? Exactly, exactly. So you can you can deal with anything after that. <laughs> like, oh, it's complicated to get this project built, and you're like, yeah, you know what? I spent twelve years in school. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> No, so, no, I was, I was, I, I did it. I mean, I was, I was, a, uh, uh, I was a, um, a good student and yeah. I went uh, through the whole thing year by year. But, but the average student would, would be like uh, stumbling and, you know, yeah. running around for years before graduation. So, so, so is it the first three years everyone's taking basically the same courses, and then after that, er, people choose their own path and start to specify? No, it's it's not not exactly like that. So we had some courses that were specific to architecture, like history of architecture, mm -hmm. and uh, something that was called uh, uh, 
Analysis of Forms. <laughs> it was kind of a pompous uh, <laughs> title, but it was basically freehand drawing and, uh, oh, and right. <laughs> basically drawing, yeah. basically, yeah. you know, uh, <clears throat> and, and a little bit of a kind of conceptual thinking, I, I, I would okay. say. It was a weird uh, subject where, <laughs> I mean, you had to basically draw nudes, for example. They will bring, mm. like in the classical uh, Bossart tradition, yeah, French yeah, yeah. Bossart tradition, they, you would basically, they will bring you nude people and you would have to quickly sketch them. And, uh, and th this kind of, uh, of things was part of the education. <clears throat> but then you had, so basically you had that, that side of history of art and history of architecture and... Uh, <clears throat> And uh, and then this kind of drawing, technical drawing also. So there was technical drawing. There was uh, there was uh, this kind of freehand drawing or kind of art. Uh, 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 and then there were maths and maths and physics and and uh, uh, geometry and and this kind of stuff. So it was um, it was, uh, but still, with the basic maths that you went through, you were you were supposed to be able to jump to electrical engineer and be able to follow. Wow! In the third year, so it was it was very. <clears throat> I mean, the maths and and the geometry was were hard. Basically. Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting to hear. Um, most schools that I'm aware of these days do not operate like that at an undergraduate no. level, uh, for sure. I do know, actually, the school I went to, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, back, yeah, well, Cal, back Cal in Poly the time. Cal Poly is quite technical, no? It, it is. It is quite technical. It, it, it <laughs> is, for sure. I think it is It is compared to some universities, definitely. definitely. But it's also a fairly large architecture uh, student body group. Not as big as what you mentioned, but still, it means that there's a diversity of teachers so it yeah. really depends on the teachers you have. I was going to say, though, I know that during the 70s, around that time, um, I know the students at Cal Poly, the architecture students, were taking engineering courses with the engineers, more yeah. like what you're describing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, brutal. But, I mean, Cal Poly is one of the technical schools no, in the U.S. It's known as one of the technical engineering schools, no? Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a polytechnic, so they have a extremely exactly. robust engineering program. Yeah. Yeah. I think some folks think their architecture program is therefore hyper technical. Yeah, and in my experience, it's it's not like what you're describing these days. Yeah. Um, again, it's more technical than maybe others, but it's not. It yeah. depends on who you have. So you can you can get through Cal Poly and just have nothing yeah. but conceptual theory stuff for five years if you have certain teachers. Yeah. yeah. Um. So you finish school. You made it through, and then you immediately do Did you a want master's. To after school? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, weren't you like sick of school? Weren't you? I mean, at, when you finished, didn't you think to yourself, "I want to go practice now. I want to. I don't know." No, I, 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 I didn't really have a, a ca career plan. I mean, it was like uh, totally. <clears throat> you know, it's not like. I mean, it was. I just. Uh, I was not educated in, in, in I mean, I, and I think in, in Europe, in my, in my times, there was not this kind of designing of a career that yeah. uh, now yeah. people have. So you just kind of, you, you knew that you had to study, you study something that you like. And then, mm. you know, there was no joblessness. Uh, the economy was doing well. So you know, you knew that more or less you would, you would find a job or whatever. So I, I finished and, the day I finished, I <clears throat> I was actually working in the last the last three years. I was working part time in in offices, in architecture offices in Madrid, uh, fairly good ones, doing housing. I mean, like uh, doing projects that uh, very few architects these days will do, except in China. No? Like you know, suddenly. Uh, 1,500 units of uh, housing. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, I I finished, and one of the guys that in the office where I was working uh, with, which you, I mean, is, was well known at the, at the time there, but nobody will know uh, now. Uh, um, basically, uh, told me that uh, Rafael Moneo. You know who Rafael Moneo is, or sure, yeah, 
Oh, okay. <laughs> so Rafael Moneo was in Madrid, but was back then was at Harvard, was the, 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 the Harvard chair. Oh. And, uh, and so somebody told me, oh, you know, he needs uh, some guy to do a project, etc. cetera. And, uh, and um, so I, I just finished. So it was like, uh, 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 it looked, I mean, I actually never liked very much Rafael Moneo's work, but, <laughs> but, but I thought, okay, well, you know, the, uh, let's start uh, somewhere, yeah. no? So I went to to Rafael's office and I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> well, why? Well, first of all, he was not. He was back, back then. He was not there very often. I mean, he, he was. He was okay. I mean, he was like he would come every every month for a few days and would basically scream at everybody and insult <laughs> everybody and, <laughs> cool. and then leave. No, I mean, yeah. uh, I, I, I just don't like his, I, I, I don't like his character and I don't like his, uh, I, I mean, it's not that, that I, I, I mean, I, I, I respect him. I, I think he's a very, very intelligent guy, but, but, but I don't think he is, I mean, like he does good architecture because he's smart. And uh, and that's all. I mean, and, and so you can deny his uh, capacity. He's done some some very good buildings. I mean, it's it's not uh, it's not that I <clears throat> I despise him or anything like that. I mean, I, I I really respect him, but I I was never that interested in in the work. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and then when I went there, and you know. Uh, I saw him mistreating people, and uh, I, I really I was not used to that kind of style, and mm -hmm. I left. Yeah. I left as, after three months. Wow. Wow. But yeah. but 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 because of of going there, then I realized oh, so there is the place called Harvard that uh, is in the U.S. and this guy <laughs> is teaching there. So why don't I apply to that? And I applied, and I was accepted. You applied as, uh, a, as a faculty or as a no, student? No, as a student. No, no, as a student, as a oh, kind okay, of okay. master student. Gotcha. And I got a, I got a scholarship, and so oh. I basically went. Wow. Yeah, so that's you saw awesome. him there. <laughs> yeah. And I, yeah, yeah, and I saw him there, and I was, I mean, the stories with Rafael are, are very funny, but because I, I, I mean, it's not that I, uh, I mean, I said I, I hated the office. I didn't hate him. I, or I, it's not that I, I think he's, uh, is uh, stupid work or anything like that, but it's uh, I I I was kind of skeptical mm -hmm. about uh, about the work and <clears throat> but not not really about his uh, capacity or his sure. uh, yeah. Yeah. intelligence, which is obviously very very important. But but so I I went and I and I met uh, him several times there and I had some very funny stories with uh, with him of, of that time because I actually the, the other interesting thing is that when I said I was leaving he you know <clears throat> he gave me a lecture like I'm not exaggerating for for 45 minutes <laughs> wow the day I, I said Rafael I'm leaving he kind of came to my desk and uh, almost as if he was uh, um, a priest. Yeah, it was he's, he's a little bit of a priest. I mean, he he has this kind of background, but <clears throat> but he gave me a lecture of why it's important that I was in a, that I work in an office. I mean, like you know, it's one guy who comes to your office and leaves after three months. You don't give a shit. Yeah. 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 Okay, goodbye. <laughs> but he actually he actually did and and kind of. So he has this kind of, uh, which I, I respect and I, I think is admirable in a way. <clears throat> um, so then I, I I met him. Obviously, he was the chair, and I was one of the students. And I bumped into him a few times in the in the <laughs> corridor. And uh, <clears throat> I was uh, totally a, com a computer illiterate at the time. Hmm. But when I go got there. I saw that there were computers, and I thought, well, maybe that, maybe I should, I should, I should study a little bit of this because it looks promising. And then I liked it, and I started 
I started uh, taking more and more courses. And I remember one day I bumped into him in the corridor and I said, so, so what are you taking this term? And, and I said, well, I'm, I'm taking computer course number 35. I mean, like, I, I really took several courses <laughs> and, and, and he, he despised yeah. computer yeah. time. I mean, it's probably still does, but, <laughs> but uh, he, he grabbed me from, from my elbow. He has something that is the famous Monero press, which is a, he has a particular way of holding your, your hand like that and pushing it up almost until it hurts. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and, and he said, well, this is interested in the worst sense of the term. He told me in Spanish, I don't know if the, the interested is, it's difficult to translate. It's like you are doing it because you just want to make money. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, and anyway, uh, I mean, this, this kind of, uh, encounters, but, but, uh, uh, anyway, so basically I, I went to Harvard and I took a lot of computer courses and then I met Sanford Quinter and I met Bram mm. Kulhas and I met a number of people that were important later on in my career. So, uh, and I did well. I mean, I, 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 I hardly spoke any English at the time. I was going to ask you yeah, mm. if you had studied English before you moved there. No, no, no. My first foreign language, in fact, is German. Oh. oh. Yeah. So, for so, some so strange... that's super helpful. Yeah, <laughs> yeah not the same. <laughs> so I, 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 and I actually, I, I did three studios. Uh, the first one was with Denise Scott Brown. Okay. Oh, no kidding. So I am probably the last uh, European student of Dennis Scott Brown. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> and then the second one with, uh, was with uh, Liz Diller and Rick Scofidio. Uh-huh. And the last one with, uh, was, was Thesis, basically, which I did with, uh, with Ram Kuljas. Jeez. Uh, so it was, you know, incredible yeah. array of uh, things. But, but, you know, with Dennis Scott Brown, I could basically hardly speak to her. Um, yeah. I mean, she she was this kind of incredibly sophisticated woman, and she was like talking about uh, interesting things, and and I can and I, I I kind of follow, but I couldn't really answer. Mm -hmm. yeah, she doesn't <laughs> speak. At, at some, she doesn't speak no. Spanish, so yeah. <laughs> no. So basically, uh, I think at some point she she gave up, and I. <laughs> I, I, I did very well because there was a guy who was her assistant who now passed away a mm. few years back. What was the name of this guy? It's a Jewish, very, very funny guy who worked with Rafael Vignoli later on in the, was the associate of uh, Rafael Vignoli in the, in the project for Ground Zero. I mean, as oh. his own office. Um, hmm. Uh, maybe I remember later, but but it was a very nice guy, and for some reason he liked me, and basically he helped me, uh, and uh, and and I ended up doing very well in the in the studio, but without talking to the <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. We actually had her on the show not not too long ago. Um, yeah. It's oh, really? the, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah we'll wow. send you the link. Yeah, I'll send yeah. you the link. Yeah, yeah. I, would, I would love to see to see what uh, what she answers yeah but anyway yeah. so so <clears throat> so that was harvard and then <laughs> basically at harvard i met rem and then rem asked me to go to rotterdam and i went to rotterdam <clears throat> so uh, a quick question about harvard yeah when you applied to harvard you didn't have a predetermined or understanding of what you would be doing specifically I feel like no, some I, folk, you didn't, right? Some folks, they choose to go to get a master's because they know yeah. I want to further study this aspect of architecture. No idea. <laughs> I, would, I was a real Spanish peasant. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and in a way, I think that was useful because what, uh, what um, if I wasn't a peasant, I would probably have um, joined the Moneo intelligentsia so he had this kind of <laughs> group of students and and faculty that were interested in certain things and they were doing certain things and it was like in every place there was a kind of orthodoxy and and yeah. 
but but because Harvard is very large, there were people like Sanford Quinter who is like a UFO, or or right. <laughs> or even Rem was a UFO. Um, yeah. Maybe Denis Corbin was was closer to uh, to what Raphael uh, stood for, but but uh, so I ended up not being part of of the orthodoxy there, mm-hmm. and I think that was good for me. Yeah. Uh, I mean, not not because there were not valid people in the orthodoxy. I mean, there were people like Michael Hayes. No, Michael Hayes was the kind of theory guy mm. at Harvard at the time, and and I don't like at all what he stands for. I never, I, I never understood wh- why he he. I mean, I think he's a kind of again a cap- capable guy, but. Uh, but I didn't take a single bloody course with Michael Hayes, which was very strange <laughs> at the time. Right, right. right because right. everybody went through For his the... courses and because yeah. it was part of the orthodoxy. So I, huh. instead I took Sanford Quinter or, or, you know, I mean, so that, that kind of marginal, uh, peasant like <laughs> arrival, uh, yeah. uh, and also the scale of the school, because if, if it is a small school, then, then, then you basically have no option but, but yeah. to do whatever everybody does. But but the GSD is huge, so you yeah. could, you could basically um, spread in in many different directions. And 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 I I, I mean I, I had a, a was a fantastic for me because of that. And I met people that were later on very important. It's me. crazy to hear the names that you're mentioning. Yeah, uh, a specific that's... question is. Harvard is the is the school that has I forget the name of the building is it Gund it's the trays Gund, Gund Hall Gund Hall yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. was yeah. that the yeah, building the that yes, you were yes, in yes, yes. Oh, okay yeah, cool. interesting yes, yes. Where, where in Gund Hall were you we were at like the very bottom sitting underneath <laughs> a beam you, you kept you, you you every term you you were assigned to a different um, place ah so you didn't stay in one in one place all all the way through. <clears throat> they they kept moving, so you had to move all your crap to the <laughs> to another place every every term. And I mean, it's it's very. I I used to have a friend who used to say, "Well, you know, the trays like you you see um, you see the other guys, and la- and like you know, IIT, which is all flat, and 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 mm-hmm. you yeah. don't see." I used to say, well, the good thing about this is that uh, you you see who is cheap every day. <laughs> <laughs> every day. Like you can really, yeah. uh, it's like a theater. It's, so it has this kind of theatrical uh, quality yeah. that, that uh, well, you see everybody and, and you see everybody with, with, with some sort of uh, perspective. No, it's not as yeah. if they are on your eyesight but yeah. you yeah. see you look at them da- from above and you see <laughs> how they are moving <laughs> it's such a weird thing it's such a weird thing Sounds like a lab I, I don't know if i could have survived in, in gun hall <laughs> i think i would have gone crazy <laughs> it was it was no actually people used to build literal um uh, sheds <laughs> yeah with cardboard yeah exactly to avoid uh, what you are saying yeah to, to avoid exposure <laughs> It really is like an experiment. That's, that's really an experiment. <laughs> did you did you find that your time at Harvard um, maybe made you realize your stronger interest in architecture, or maybe those came from undergrad? Like, did you? By, no, by, no. I, yeah, go ahead. I was I was already Hopes. very motivated in, in Madrid, so that that happened before. Gotcha. Um. And then afterwards, you go and work. You work at OMA for a few yes. years, correct? Yes. What was that uh, like? For, for three years, it was very, very, very interesting, very exciting at the time, and and very catastrophic, <laughs> also. <laughs> <Why>? <laughs> because well, it was. I mean, basically, I mean, Prem is a really intense and interesting character and uh <clears throat> but he didn't have a clue about how to make a building <laughs> and so he had this kind of uh, great projects in france and in germany and <clears throat> and he was trying to basically build them but 
the people that uh, he was hiring were people like me who <laughs> didn't know much more. I mean, maybe maybe I knew a little bit more of details and things like that because of my Spanish education. But, you know, to make it a, a convention center, you need a little bit more <laughs> than that. <don't laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so basically, I mean, like it was like the lights would go off uh, every month because they will shut down the lights because the office was not paying for the for for the electricity bills or you know <laughs> huge huge financial problems huge financial or they wouldn't pay your salary for four months or mm-hmm. <laughs> things like that it was like a real catastrophe nonstop but still very exciting and and it was at the beginning so there was a a small office maybe. Maybe when I was there, maybe the, there were like 20 people or wow. that. So it was fairly um, small yeah. and uh, intense. I mean, like we worked nonstop, uh, night, days, weekends. Mm-hmm. Uh, <clears throat> but it was obviously very exciting and very interesting. It's really uh, hard I, to imagine OMA being 20 people because now they're hundreds for sure. They, I don't know whether they are. I mean, I don't know how big they are now, but I think they're hundreds. I could be mistaken, but I thought they were. No, no, it's probably, probably 150 or 200 or something right. like that. Yeah. So I don't know whether, I actually don't know whether they go to 200. Eh? I, I, I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, maybe not. Maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> But um, but anyway, so that's that's what happened. Um, I went there and I had to leave because when I was there, I I got a letter from the Spanish Ministry of Defense saying that I had to go back to Spain to do my military service. Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> 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 And then and then I I basically tried to escape and, and uh, get all kinds of uh, fake medical letters <laughs> saying that I was not fit. <laughs> right, flat and, feet. And actually, yeah. <laughs> and actually, when when I when I told Rem, he said uh, he actually the first thing he did was to try to help and said, well, you know, I know these guys who are the doctors, he's a doctor in an important hospital in Rotterdam and and he may be able to help you with that. Mm-hmm. And so I went to I went to this guy, he, this guy uh, made a letter, but actually it was a serious letter. Right? Like like he actually interviewed me to know what uh-huh. was uh, and try to find in my character something that was <laughs> very thorough. And did they find anything? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. okay. So things, probably. I, I don't remember what. Uh, but anyway, I I got that letter and I got another letter in in in, uh, in England or or something. And they, they and then I went to the military thing and uh, ah, but but even more funny was that when I told. Rem, that I was planning to declare myself uh, mentally unfit. <laughs> uh, he said, oh, but, you know, I I did the same. And and I regret, I regret it because I always wanted to be part of an army. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Some insights to the mindset of Rem Coolhouse. <laughs> 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 Uh, and then, and they said, and, and by the way, there, there was the the year I I I did it. I there were three guys who did it, uh, who basically um, escaped the military in the Netherlands, and one of them was this guy, and, and he knew the other two guys or something. And, and he says, and actually, the other two guys, one of them uh, said that he was gay, and and actually, after a few years, he came out. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and, and Rem said that and I said that I was uh, mad and uh, any any of these days they can, they may declare myself uh, formally medically mad right, right, right but anyway he tried to help but it didn't work so I had to go back <laughs> mm. 
Uh, and uh, and then I, uh, while I was there, I made a fuss and I said that I was depressed. And I mean, it's a, it's a kind of very long uh, story. But but I I went back to Madrid, and at the same time as I declare myself uh, depressed in the military uh, thing, I I also mm, I was also teaching as a part-time teacher in the School of Architecture, hmm. and they didn't connect one with another. <laughs> so I was I was basically going to, a, I, I, I didn't know any, any doctor in, in Madrid, so I just went to one that was close to my home, and, uh, and, I, <clears throat> and I went there and I said that I was depressed because I had to leave my job in Holland and blah, blah, blah. And then he gave me a letter uh, saying, okay, for a month, this guy says he's depressed, so please let him go and blah, blah, blah. And, <clears throat> and then I, I kept, I had to go for, for a year, nearly a year, every week to some sort of um, psychotherapy <laughs> session. <laughs> when I, when I, so I, I tried to study the Rorschach and I went through all these tests. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to fake them, but uh, it's kind of difficult to, to fake them. Sure. But, but somehow, somehow I think that <clears throat> they also saw that I could be, I think it was manic depressive or something like that. So... <laughs> So that was the kind of potential of me being mentally ill, and and uh, and so that's basically what uh, I kept asking for these letters, and then and then when I was nine months in, into the year that I had to do the military service, uh, saying that I was ill, the guy uh, told me, well, you know, you have to face your problems and go and. And I said, okay, okay, I'll face my problems. I, I, but I didn't go back. Basically, I, I stopped sending letters, mm -hmm. and I didn't go back. But at the time, they they had too many people, and so they didn't give a shit. Basically, yeah, they didn't care. <laughs> they didn't notice, or they pretended that I, that I, that they didn't notice, and nobody called me ever again. And the whole thing expired, and <laughs> yeah. <I> mean, <laughs> <laughs> You're going to get a call after this comes out. <laughs> Sarah, you owe us uh, X years of service. Um, exactly. So that's actually the reason why you left Olmey, but this is this also, you started your own office after you well, left uh, Olmey. Yeah, and then, and then, <clears throat> and then I kind of uh, went back for a little while to the Netherlands and then I moved to, uh, to London and that's where we started uh, foreign office architects on the, because basically we got a job at the, at the AA to teach a unit. Okay. 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 And so that, that was the reason to move to London and, and then to kind of start an office, but it wasn't really an office. It was basically doing competitions mm -hmm. to see yeah. whether we could get, um, something. And, and then suddenly uh, after one year of trying, we got, we got Yokohama. So, That's crazy. Yeah. So, I, I, so I had two questions about uh, yeah. FOA. One, yeah. how did you come up with the name? And then two, well, it's, yeah, what's the first question? That's the first question. How did you come up with the name? Well, because, because it was, I mean, we were both uh, <clears throat> from different places working in, in, in a country that was uh, of neither and... Uh, Mm -hmm. I I guess it was an idea that that came out of OMA of the experience of OMA, no? Because in OMA also everybody was from, from a different place, and and so I I thought that uh, <clears throat> that the idea of uh, of uh, uh, people from different cultures coming together and and um, talking. Uh, uh, talking about one issue, but uh, but having in a way the freedom to to not having to comply with certain um, orthodoxies or mm -hmm. etiquettes is liberating. No, I mean, like if if you are educated in Spain, for example, and then 
and then you know the system very well. I think this is particularly true of of uh, European cultures. You know that they have, they are kind of all cultures, and everybody knows what everybody else is gonna do, and everybody is working within a very constrained set of rules. Yeah, that means that is in a way you you have much less freedom to. <clears throat> To consider a certain yeah. question, no, and 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 so the realization of that power of foreignness or or alienation uh, would be the kind of the, the, or the, the kind of more classical word uh, for it uh, was was very positive. I th- I, I I thought. And so that's somehow how the the idea of, of being a foreigner or being an alien um, <clears throat> um, came to be the name of the of the office, uh, and also you know the London location with the foreign office. It was in fact illegal to call. You cannot <laughs> call you. <laughs> You cannot call yourself like a like a public ministry, so it, that's why it it had to be called formally. It was registered as FOA. Interesting. Uh, well, uh, I uh, I ask because I CIA so, or MI five. Exactly, exactly. You cannot call yourself CIA. Yeah. <laughs> well, I like it. I like I like the name. I like the idea behind it. One of the sort of a tangent, but obviously Marina's not from the United States and. Although we're in California and I'm from here, I often feel like a foreigner in California. And one of the aspects that I, I the, we come across in our own practice that drives me nuts is, the, this is more about clients, but clients wanting to hire a local person because they're local. And that f- kind of philosophically has always been the exact, that's like the opposite of who I would want to hire if I was hiring a creative person. So. Yeah. I very much, uh, I think we're in line with what you're describing. And, and there is something it's... empowering about being a foreigner. And I remember when I left France after graduating and moving to New York, like knowing that I wasn't from the place, I felt like it, I was meant to be asking questions all the times because nobody was exactly. expecting me to know yeah. anything about the place I was in. And I feel like, exactly. you know, I always say that to, to people who like move abroad and want to go abroad is that use that to your advantage because it's yeah. a superpower, you know. Exactly, exactly. But I mean, it's like uh, I mean, being like Spanish or French culture and very structured, yeah, no? yeah. like. But and probably by the time you you if you finish school in France, you 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 knew very well in a very sophisticated uh, way what you were supposed to to do and what were the questions and how yeah, to answer yeah. to these questions because the system is very closed so mm. so i think that liberation was uh, was uh, an important was an important uh, realization i i think that that came out of the oma ex- experience it, it is also a, uh, i mean it has pros and cons no because I mean, also japan for example is a, mm. is a very very narrow culture is a very closed uh, culture and uh, and that's one of the reasons, perhaps, why it doesn't it doesn't evolve faster. I mean, if there is one one reason why American culture has evolved mm-hmm. faster is because it it has this kind of uh, in, in, um, intrinsic foreignness about it mm-hmm. that that turns it into into a, a little bit of an experiment. Yeah. But but obviously, it doesn't produce things that are as sophisticated as Japan. Uh, mm. uh, yeah. France, maybe no. I mean, like, mm. mm-hmm, mm-hmm. or things that last as long as those places. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly. Right. That's exactly. Definitely the case. <laughs> exactly. That's definitely the case. <laughs> um, but, so uh, you you're you're teaching at the AA. You have the office. You're doing competitions for a year, which is a yeah. long time to be you know yeah. doing competitions. Yeah. Competitions are brutal. <laughs> Do you know how many They're... you did in that year? <laughs> I'm curious. Not not that many. Not that many. I mean, maybe three or four. Mm-hmm. Wow. I mean, we we were. Uh, it was also the first year at the AA, so we were, we were, uh, uh, we had to basically work on yeah. on setting up the unit. And I mean, the the AA was just, uh, also a very interesting system and and brutal system of uh, constant 
competition and, and clash with your colleagues. So as opposed to uh, most other schools that where there is at least some sort of attempt to work together or represent a certain um, scope mm -hmm. about uh, or a certain position about the, the profession, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, it's, it's all about having almost extravagant positions hmm. and defending these positions against other people with opposite equally extravagant positions. <laughs> and so it, it it is also a system of survival. You need to kind of build up uh, discourse and, and uh, defend it against other um, other people who have uh, very often opposite uh, perspectives mm -hmm. about what to do. Did you enjoy your time at the AA and specifically that very aspect much. of it? Very much, yeah. very much. Uh, at the beginning, it's painful because <laughs> it's, it's scary and uh, and everybody tries to mistreat you and things like that. But once you master it, then, then it's fun. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. That's cool. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> that was very important in terms of uh, helping me uh, articulate a, a position and articulate a, a certain a certain discourse that and obviously the kind of fortune of uh, hitting Yokohama and being a project in Japan and being a project about transportation and public space and, mm. and uh, was basically all working in in a consistent direction no? with uh, I mean, the whole the whole idea of foreigners also had to do with with uh, globalization. No, I mean, the reason mm -hmm. why you are from France and you are in Los Angeles and uh, I am from Spain and I am in London is because the world is becoming or was becoming in increasingly global. Now it looks as if we are in, uh, already in the post global world, but mm -hmm. but in those years, <clears throat> globalization was. Uh, was exciting, was uh, yeah. interesting, was producing entirely new things. And uh, and one of the things it was producing is that kind of convergence of people from different origins and different backgrounds into, in, uh, into the same problem or the same concern or the same, you know, the same process. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I feel like it's probably necessary, it's certainly very productive to be surrounded by folks of, of different positions, as you put it, um, as a way to understand yourself and your position better. I find that if, if in the times I've been in groups, various types of groups where there's too much group think in one direction, I feel very uncomfortable. There's something very weird about it. It makes me uneasy. My skin starts to itch. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, group thinking is a is a big problem uh, mm -hmm. everywhere. I think, uh, and uh, and in a way that that uh, kind of foreignness or globalization was uh, an opportunity to escape from group thinking. What was it uh, like when you won the Yokohama Terminal Project? Because that it's crazy, right? I mean, well, it's it was... a significant project. I I remember studying it in school because it was a phenomenal project. But so, what was it like when it was well, announced that you won? Uh, obviously, it was amazing. It was like, uh, like you know, suddenly your world changes, and uh, uh, basically we decided to move to Japan to do the project because it was such an important project, and um, and so everything was upside down suddenly. Uh, well, actually, not immediately because we won in '95, and then <clears throat> the project didn't take off for several years because we had all kinds of fights with the client. The client was very unhappy that uh, the jury had given the prize to to this project and uh, they didn't know how to deal with us, we didn't know how to deal with them. We were very unprofessional uh, <laughs> at the time. <laughs> and uh, so it took um, five years. The project wouldn't have been built if, if it wasn't because Japan won the World Cup and with oh. Korea. And then <clears throat> they wanted to have, <clears throat> they wanted to draw attention to Yokohama because Yokohama has a stadium, etc. <clears throat> and they used this project in a way to, to draw attention, international attention 
on the on the town. So it it got built by pure chance. Um, uh, um, <laughs> uh, but it got built. So then then that that basically forced us to kind of stick around at the AA for a few years between ninety five and and ninety nine for nearly four years and uh, and develop the whole theory around the, the project, the whole theory around globalization, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that was conceptually also good that it didn't mm-hmm. happen immediately. <laughs> and then it happened, we, we moved to Japan, we were there for two years, uh, living basically on the site. <laughs> that was super exciting and uh, and uh, then it got built and and then uh, and then then we went back to london and started engaging in in projects in in uh, in london and many projects also in spain at the time uh, and other places the netherlands korea uh, Turkey, the US. I mean, that was basically when you know Yokohama gave us the possibility of uh, of uh, acquiring important projects worldwide. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, was the initial competition submission different from what was built? I haven't seen the original boards. I'm just very curious, like how things evolve. Yes, I mean, geometrically, it was more or less the same, or basically the, the, the kind of formal logic was was uh, there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the material logic changed substantially. So, oh, really? Uh, yeah, because, I mean, if you look at the renders, the the first the first um, images of the project were, were a surface that looked almost like concrete. I mean, it didn't mm-hmm. look like concrete because we were doing these renders, were not renders, they were basically AutoCAD hidden line drawings. <laughs> right. Uh, produced with a, with a 486. You probably don't know what a 486 was, but it was a very old computer with <laughs> three megabytes of RAM or something <laughs> like that. I mean, like it would, uh, today, it would be ridiculous. It was yeah. like a, a small fraction of the memory that a computer has uh, today. Did you crash the computer several times doing that? Several model? times, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, uh, but it was it was a model <clears throat> made with what uh, in AutoCAD is called rule surfaces. You, I don't know whether you work in AutoCAD, but, but I became quite a uh, proficient user at the at the time. I, I always say that that I am exactly from the generation where working on the computer did not kill you as a designer. So basically, before mm. me, yeah. before my generation, if you try to um, work in a computer, you would end up being a nerd. So right. you would stop being an architect because the the energy that it took um, <clears throat> you to become an architect uh, basically made you unable to uh, to, to basically to operate the computer would make you unable to to uh, work as an architect mm-hmm. yeah. and so it was i mean for example when i when i went to harvard i did the first project i did with a computer was was the studio i did with uh, with dilian uh, scofidio <laughs> That was my second term there. The the thesis that I did with Rem was, and I mean that was a kind of experiment that went more or less okay. Um, and then then the thesis which I did with Rem was was really a kind of computer project. It mm-hmm. was a kind of warped surface, and I mean things that that you cannot do without without. I mean you need to draw on three in three D in order to think that. Mm-hmm. And uh, and it it was the 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 I was the only person on that year who was working on a thesis in the in the computer. And then the next year there were already 
five or six, because I stayed one extra term on a scholarship at Harvard after finishing. So I noticed that that uh, the the amount of users of of CAD increased exponentially already the next year after. So that we are talking about 1990. I think <laughs> 1990 is the kind of threshold. <laughs> okay. So, so, uh, so b- basically, before 1990, you couldn't do both things. After 1990, the accessibility of the of the, the system was uh, such that that you could actually keep doing architecture and engage with with a computer. Yeah. But so, uh, and then the, the the next year after I left. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know because I, I mean I had friends who were still around that the the GSD um, changed all the trays and put cables on all the trays in order <laughs> to provide um, access to the server to all the terminals that that yeah. people had in the trays, and then everybody, absolutely everybody, from then on, only work on the computer. Interesting. Uh, but but in my times, I mean, I my whole uh, first degree in, in architecture was done with uh, conventional, I mean, like like Trashing. pens and rotrings and <laughs> and this kind of mylar. stuff. Mylar, yeah, exactly, mylar. <clears throat> yeah, it's interesting. I think one could actually argue that in a way now the computer is also dictating too much what an architect does. I think when younger designers use BIM softwares, they get trapped into this cycle of just learning software and defaulting yeah. to whatever components come as a set in the in the programs no yeah i, mean, I don't know i'm, I'm always uh, i always think that uh, every technology can has certain drawbacks but generally speaking um i i, I think they uh, you are enabled rather than disabled by by yeah, these yeah. Uh, by these tools. So I I like. Uh, I mean, of course, now I cannot uh, compete with uh, <laughs> with uh, people can, that uh, are working here. Or or but but uh, I mean, for me, the the, the kind of computer. <clears throat> The engagement with the computer at uh, Harvard was also very important in 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 shaping everything that uh, we did at DAA, no? Because at mm-hmm. DAA, the the unit was very much based on quantitative analysis and and geometry and things that in some ways came out of the the an AutoCAD menu. Mm. So the the fact that you that you, when you draw in a computer, you draw with uh, with commands, with instructions mm-hmm. that are applied to all the entities in the drawing. Like if you change the window, you change the window everywhere, or uh, because you've changed the block. So that kind of thinking systematically about about the project was, I think, very much part of what uh, the unit was. Um, Studying, which was really the, the other thing. I, 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 I mean, I've t- I've told this to Patrick, uh, but I I believe that Deep Five, which was basically our unit at the at the AA, was the first um, the first example of parametric architecture mm-hmm. because the the idea of of parameters uh, is something that that we became aware of. By working on on a computer, which is something that I I don't think that hmm. that Patrick, for example, has ever worked in a computer. I mean, Patrick came out of the the Saha RT whatever uh, operation, mm-hmm. and uh, I don't think that he is capable actually of drawing anything in the computer. Very very few architects from my generation are able to draw on AutoCAD. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that's <laughs> from what I've seen. That that would be, I would yes, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, like Greg, even even Greg, who is I think a fantastic um, thinker, and, uh, Greg Lee. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know whether Greg actually sits down and draws on the computer. Yeah, we've had know. we've we've attempted to have him on the show with the schedules have not aligned. So when it, when it happens, we'll ask him. <laughs> So, so basically, that that was uh, that was also an important part of the of the yeah. uh, 
the construction of the unit, the, 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 the kind of parametric analysis, the quantitative analysis. And then, then, you know, it, it took off and I actually, he gave it a very good name, but, <laughs> but I, I would uh, say that when Patrick learned of these things because of us, I mean, it, that, that didn't fit naturally into Saha's inclinations <laughs> at all at the time. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Well, he's another person that we have to have on the show at some point. Yeah. Um, I did want to ask a question about the terminal project, which is, did that help you validate yourself as an architect and your ideas about architecture? And I don't mean that from an outsider's perspective in terms of now the world sees you as an architect, now we can hire these people to do buildings. I mean, more internally for you, did you find that psychologically it validated your beliefs because now you've won this competition and it's been built as opposed yeah, to staying? Of course. I mean, it was, it was an incredible uh, ego boost, no? <laughs> 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 like it, it, it gave us confidence to do anything, no? If you yeah. can do a $200 million project, um, <laughs> Uh, of that complexity, then you can do anything. <clears throat> of course, it's not true. I mean, we we had enormous help from the Japanese construction industry. That that project at the time wouldn't have been possible in 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 many other countries. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and so it wasn't our our merit. Uh, it was the merit of also the local industry. And I mean, going back to the the discussion we were having before about uh, foreignness or. Mm -hmm. One of the things I regret about the, the the Yokohama project, which I would build in an entirely different way today, but uh, but that's a different discussion. Uh, 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 what was I going to say? I lost my. Uh, You're saying that that uh, we were talking about foreignness, and I. Ah uh, yes, yes. Um, uh, yes, that, you know, if you go there, the project is very raw. It's very, it's almost badly finished hmm. because we stretch the technology to such degree that, mm. that, you know, um, basically when you stretch a technology then then uh, then there are more mistakes there are more irregularities etc and this is part of the of the project but uh, if you think about uh, japanese buildings from maki or 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 ito or Se sejima uh, mm. i mean that that kind of finesse that you can get built in Japan is one of the things that I regret not to have exploited more. Uh, I see. <laughs> yeah. So that kind of uh, finesse of uh, of craft is is something that uh, we challenged with the with the Yokohama project and and uh, and I think in some ways it it produced interesting things, but in some other ways maybe it missed some other opportunities. Did you get to do more projects in Japan after this one? No. No. No, everybody was dead scared of getting near. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, the, uh, I mean, everybody knows that it was a struggle and that we were very hard and very difficult and that we, st we didn't negotiate very much. Which was a mistake. I mean, I, I I would have done it entirely different, as I said today. Yeah. And I, and I would probably have engaged in a different way, with the client and with the contractors. And so there was a kind of level of um, professionality, which was good because it, it it allowed the project to happen in mm -hmm. in such a way. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but there was also a level of uh, you know not knowing really how to how to do things and, and maybe how to make things easier for everybody, including yourself. Right, 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 <clears throat> right, right. <laughs> I mean, Which, I can... Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe it's like kind of um, age. Yeah. <laughs> Grow, growing up yeah. is, uh, is that. And, and, but so, no, no, in, in Japan, we, we build, uh, 
<clears throat> another thing later on, which was was actually the the National Spanish Pavilion in in an international exhibition, but it was a commission from Spain. It was mm-hmm. not a commission from Japan. <laughs> And now, a little break for our show sponsors. Say goodbye to design-unfriendly spreadsheets. Programma, built by designers for designers, provides an integrated suite of tools for every phase of your project, from mood boards to advanced specification tools to project management. Seamlessly integrated, easily shareable, and always current, Programma reduces redundancy and minimizes costly errors. Share your work in a format that works for you, be it PDF, spec sheets, or online branded client dashboards with always up-to-date specification details. Join interior design movers and shakers and start for free by clicking the programmer link in our show notes. Experience the difference with Programma, software built for interior design workflows. Are you interested in a computer program that combines construction drawings and 3D modeling in one software and one model? Well, if so, you should check out the program Archicad. Archicad leads the industry by enabling architecture and interior design firms around the world to 3D design supported by innovative technology that expands as far as the imagination can stretch. As Archicad continues to evolve with technological advances, architects can put push that technology to their advantage while working in an accurate model. You can start your free, fully functioning trial today by clicking the Archicad link in our episode notes. So you do the project, you have the office for 18 years, for quite some time. Were you teaching throughout that entire period as well? Or No, no, no. Uh, we stopped the unit in... in... 1999, and then... And then we stopped teaching and we, we did some teaching in like studios in, in Columbia or in uh, UCLA or Princeton. Like guest, uh, guest faculty uh, kind of guest, positions. Yeah, yeah. Like, like, uh, option studios in the States, but it was like one of like in, in different places. Gotcha. Uh, but we we didn't have a kind of permanent uh, position at the time. Was there during that time was in was there an interest in teaching more full time? Because no. it's no, really, no, no. Because uh, you know we had a lot of work and it was exciting and you know I don't know there was no no interest in. Uh, and uh, well, but then I <clears throat> I became dean of the Berlach Institute. So <laughs> that was a kind of uh, so it wasn't really that it was an interest, but somehow an opportunity. Somebody called me and said, "Would you like to do this?" And I I had been uh, the Berlach was one of the places where I I taught like now and then option studios and then and then the opportunity came up and then i decided to take it <clears throat> but it was a very <clears throat> low-key mm-hmm. engagement because i was going there once a week uh, and uh, so it was a lot of fun i it was great the Berlage was a fantastic place i i have a very good uh, but the, also the infrastructure was was different because there was one guy who was better than Mimitsa, who was the, the vice dean already for years, uh, and who is a fantastic guy, who is today in, in Chicago in, at the mm-hmm. IIT. Oh. <clears throat> and he was basically the guy who was running everything. And so you know, I, I was like kind of artistic director, and I would arrive there <laughs> and say uh, kind of few things, and then things would happen. But, but yeah. Evedran was really the engine of the institution. Uh, I mean, it was it was almost like a part time deanship, basically. Yeah, yeah. And so it was perfect for me at the time. That's interesting. Uh, yeah, because it was it, not really teaching; it was more like um, acting as a giving shape to the program, mm-hmm. or the ter- deciding on the mm-hmm. content, or hiring people to teach different courses. And, and the institution was great. It was a was a really great institution and then in 2012 or just before that you're offered the position of dean at princeton which is a significant position uh so yeah um talk about that 
uh, well, the, yeah, that was basically I got a call uh, after FOA dissolved mm -hmm. in 2011. <clears throat> I I had a, a, I was teaching at Yale at the time uh, with a kind of three year uh, contract, uh, but doing like one one term every year. Uh, teaching studio. Yeah, teaching okay. studio. But it wasn't a permanent position. It was just like one of these uh, more or less permanent, not permanent because it was just for three years. Mm -hmm. But uh, <clears throat> it was a kind of, it was an, the Norman Foster inaugural professorship at Yale. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so so yeah, you're, you're, so you're uh, teaching consistently for three years, it sounds. But yeah, but one, one term a year. Oh, one term of, a year, okay. Yeah, going going back and forth every two weeks and things like that. So it wasn't really a kind of an academic, and that right. basically opened the the possibility or the interest of um, maybe more more academic engagements. Mm -hmm. And then basically the Princeton, uh, I mean, somebody called me from the search and said, "Would you be interested?" And I say, "Okay, why not? <laughs> Let's try." Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And I did the search and I won the, the the job. So then I moved to to Princeton. I kept the office in London <clears throat> at the same time, but but I moved personally to Princeton because that was not that was a real academic job. Yeah. So it was kind of full time. Yeah. Uh, you had to be on top of things, and I mean, even if <clears throat> you still have a lot of free time and you can do work in your office, if, if you have a team that. <clears throat> that is working with you, it, it, it did require much more concentration and much more focus uh, on the academia. Yeah, yeah. It's it's interesting because I know I have many colleagues, I know many people who have uh, been teachers, most of the time uh, part-time faculty whilst having an office, and it's really, really difficult. So I cannot imagine stepping into position as a dean of a university yeah. one like princeton and but but but, uh, but princeton is very it's a very small school i mean it's it, it's almost like it's like the Berlache. The, the the amount of of uh, students that you have i mean all together including undergrads is like a, and phds is like 80 students or something like that so it's oh wow and and, and 30, 13 members of the faculty so, so almost no no, or very small uh, bureaucratic uh, duties. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's mostly kind of thinking about what to do with the program and invite people and things like that. But uh, it, I mean, I think if you're running Harvard, it's, that's a different matter. <laughs> uh, I see. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Or, or, or you know, or SIAC, <laughs> or, oh, I mean, a kind of 400 people, or 400 students school is a lot of crap that you have to deal with. But Princeton was like the Berlache, were kind of um, very easy to run uh, in terms of bureaucratic commitments. So, so but as the dean, you're you're overseeing both undergrad and graduate programs. Is that right? Yeah, but, uh, but uh, you know, the, uh, the, <clears throat> the school in Princeton has an undergraduate involvement, but the school is really vested in the graduate program. Right. And that is very strange because Princeton is actually vested into the undergraduate program. So this is a kind of fundamental schism between the interests of the university and the interests of the School of Architecture. Mm-hmm which is maybe not so good for the school uh, or for the university, but somehow that's, uh, so the, the, the undergraduates, you know, I, I don't know how it is in, I, I, I think it's not like in Cal Poly <clears throat> because Cal Poly is a professional school, but Princeton is a, is a kind of a liberal arts college. Uh, and so people, are admitted not to study architecture or um, physics or mathematics. They are admitted full stop. Oh. Uh, yeah. So they, you, you don't know, people, undergraduates in, in, in Princeton don't know what they are going to end up being. Huh, interesting. At, at all. 
Yeah. And so there is the kind of uh, freshman year, and there's the, 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 what is it called? I forgot the name, even. The sophomore uh, year. It's a sophomore, yeah. <laughs> it's a sophomore year. And, and then, so they are there for four years, and in the sophomore year, they, <clears throat> they have um, some kind of um, contingent or optative subjects uh, that they can take in different departments and so they start building up a, a set of interests and then by the time they are seniors they have one main field of interest and so Interesting. <clears throat> okay uh, and so architecture is one of them so some of them major in architecture but basically is is a more liberal arts education where they are educated in everything and then there is one field of concentration gotcha understood and and so that the, the whole undergraduate uh, school because the university as a whole is is very focused on on undergrad undergrads rather than i mean <clears throat> graduate students in princeton are shit they are interested <laughs> in in undergrads and PhDs. Okay, they don't care about uh, professional because it's not a professional, it's not a professionally driven university. You don't go to Princeton to become a lawyer. In fact, there is no law, there is no medicine. There, there are no professions there. It's more <clears throat> general education for undergrads or. Um, high-end research in math PhD. or physics and yeah or phds but professional degrees nobody cares about them the school of architecture does care about it interesting but it's the only one that cares yeah <laughs> so so the, the undergrads were basically run by the college mm -hmm. and yes they had to do i mean the, the school had to offer a number of courses for undergrads mostly studios uh, but it was a very light um, engagement uh the, the the school is mainly focused on on the on the graduate schools even if nobody really cares very much about that in the universe on, on the university level right understood <laughs> um and uh, i mean the, the other thing you know princeton has architecture which is a profession mm -hmm. but it's it's a rare thing it, it was one one president of the university i can't remember in the in the 60s or something like that, that that decided to make an architecture department and uh, a, a music department. So music and architecture were at the <laughs> same form at the same time and and uh, and implemented in the university. But there is no law, there is no medicine. Um, there is a, there is a powerful school of engineering. So that is, but is mostly dedicated to research, uh, undergrad. Basically, they teach undergrad uh, engineers and research on a high level. Gotcha. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I obviously did. I didn't attend Princeton. I have friends who went there, but I never under, really understood how it works. Um, so you start as dean at Princeton. There's a whole story with Princeton, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> There's a little bit of story with Princeton we should probably talk about. Um, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know whether you. I, I didn't know whether you were calling me because of that. <laughs> uh, you know, you it's particularly interesting. I. I don't. I. I don't care. I mean, I can talk about anything. Uh, that's perfect. Uh, about, uh, yeah, but to answer so, your question, uh, <laughs> it, it was partially that. But actually, no. I mean, I, I knew. I knew of you first because of the terminal back when I was a yeah. student. So I've known yeah. of you since that time. So that yeah. predates all this Princeton stuff. But yeah. I didn't want to ask just, just broadly. So when you decided to accept the position as dean at Princeton, did you sense before you started that there was going to be any kind of misalignment between your teaching approach and kind of pedagogy and that of uh, Liz Diller and other people at Princeton? Because that seems to be the, the, the one of the roots of the issues was that it just, it, from what I've read, it didn't sound like they, they had a different idea of how things should happen compared to you. I mean, is that? Yeah, I, I mean, there, there was, I, I knew from day one that uh, that uh, the faculty, that I was not going to get along with uh, some of the faculty. And actually not not particularly least, you know that I was a student of Liz at, uh, at Harvard. And uh, right. I, I didn't really, 
I, I, I mean, and I did well, and I got a high pass and everything. And back then, the 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 <clears throat> the, the grades were not inflated. Were not inflated, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it was a, you actually deserved the high grades, yeah, sure. <laughs> Yeah, so so basically, I I got on with her. Although I I I mean I I actually connected much better with uh, with Rick, <clears throat> but because back then you know they they were into into all the the kind of um, post structuralist vector uh, Victor Virgin and mm-hmm. and the 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 whole the whole scene of the of the post-structuralism was very much what uh, what Liz and Rick were interested in, the kind of, uh, this kind of uh, uh, weird uh, scene. Mm-hmm. But then there was, there was also there Mark Wigley and Beatrice Colomina, who's still uh, also there, and, and they were more interested in, in critical theory. I mean, that was basically what the school stood for, and I think was a powerful uh, stance at the time when they started, uh, which is when, when I was at Harvard. I mean, basically, mm. <clears throat> they Princeton was the place where, where after doing postmodernism, critical theory became more consistently um, practiced and, and proposed, and, and I think most of the of the teachers of that critical theory were were at Princeton was Liz and Beatriz and mm-hmm. and Mark <clears throat> and Justice so and Alessandra Ponte and a whole generation that came after Graves and Eisenman so mm-hmm. and, and Frampton and the kind of uh, old guys uh, mm-hmm. and try to criticize uh, the kind of politics of of the old guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, and engage with critical theory, mm-hmm. and and I think they they, I mean I I don't like critical theory. I am totally against it. But <clears throat> but I I was intrigued, and that's why I took them at Harvard because I thought it was it was an interesting take, um, and uh, and so I knew very well that that many of the faculty in the school were, and I was not going to get on with many of the faculty in the school. And I think they also knew <laughs> that, <laughs> that, the, that the dean was not going to like very much or, or support very much or be particularly interested in, in what they were doing. Right. Which is a uh, weird thing because it, by your description, right, Princeton's a small university, so it doesn't sound like there's the space to have a lot of opposing positions and debate and there's not enough uh, enough body of people for that Absolutely. to take place. Absolutely, I, I think that the reason why I was uh, appointed was not not um, not to create variety, mm-hmm. but on the contrary, to change the the. Uh, I I think there was a kind of fundamental unhappiness between the between the administration and the, with the school. Mm-hmm. The, the, the administration thought that these architect guys were fucking around and just talking about not really teaching people to build. And and so I, I, I think I was brought in as a kind of revulsive. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and, you know, there, there, are, there were all kinds of <clears throat> politics behind, but it was almost like... Um, Punishing the school with a guy who was <laughs> going to kind of uh, move things in a different direction. Yeah, I, I I thought it was a. I mean, I don't know to what degree it was <clears throat> that deliberate, because there were kind of individual interests, and, and I mean the, the 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 choosing of one chair or dean. Uh, is contingent on many, <clears throat> on many different um, things, but yeah. I, I believe that there was there was a kind of deliberate attempt to to challenge that kind of um, ex- exceedingly theoretical and uh, and um, post critical uh, no pre- sorry kind of critical uh, approach to architecture. Uh, understood as as a 
purely intellectual endeavor and, and trying to bring into the school somebody who would drive the school more towards uh, practice or towards uh, um, more mm -hmm. pragmatic, technical mm -hmm. approach. Right. And I think I read so, somewhere a word you had used was scientific, I think. Yes, that's right. So, so, but that, that was, that was something I, I realized when I got there, I didn't really have a kind of very, I, I knew the, the things that, that I wanted to promote. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but then when I went there and I started to understand, because I never really understood before what the university is and what the kind of complexity of the administration and, and things like that. But, uh, when I got there, I realized that that actually there was a a, a a very interesting opportunity that the School of Architecture could provide to the university as a whole, mm -hmm. which is uh, which is that the university has this kind of very powerful engineering <clears throat> department, huge. Well, not that huge because Princeton in general is very small, and on the other side, it has very very sophisticated. Uh, humanities uh, school. Mm -hmm. And I thought that actually what the, the School of Archite Architecture could do for the university was to try to develop some sort of middle ground because mm -hmm. I, sure. I believe that, that architecture, one of the things that it does is, is that it, it uh, mediates between the hard science or the technologies and the humanities. Uh, so that's how I solved the, the, the kind of shift towards a more scientific or more technically driven uh, program and, and you know the, the administration understood that and, and kind of uh, <clears throat> supported me at the beginning mm -hmm. but obviously it produced a lot of stress within the <laughs> within the school yeah, yeah, yes. I'm sure a lot of people were like, "What the heck?" <laughs> well, I've, I've I've seen um, department chairs and other various people in in, in different <laughs> positions enter a school new and tr and attempt to. Uh, steer the ship into sometimes a very different direction, sometimes just a slightly different direction. And yeah. I will say from what I've seen, it is extremely hard to do. Like it is extremely hard to do. It's That's just, right. That's right. Um, That's so what's, so, and then you stepped down as it in 2014. Yeah. But, but, I mean, but I, prior I, to I, that, I, 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 yeah, go ahead. No, I was just saying prior to that, you know, the, the, the challenge and the objective of, this, let's call it new new approach to direction for the school. Was that going well? I mean, was progress being made or was it just friction oh, the entire yeah. time? Huge progress, I think. Huge hmm. progress. But but uh, at the expense, I mean, basically I was bringing people like um, Andres Hake or who then became the, the dean of, uh, of Columbia or hmm. <coughs> Eyal Weizmann or or um, Liam Young, who is now hanging around in Los Angeles, I understand. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, so, so I mean, I, I brought a really a group of fantastic people um, in, in different, I mean, the problem is that I didn't have that much freedom because the positions were taken. It's not as if I could basically bring in new people. Yeah. Right. And there was, and there was a lot of pressure for me to bring more, more history and theory faculty. And I, I refused. I said, no, the school doesn't need history and theory. Mm -hmm. It has already plenty of it. It needs to develop the more technical side of it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And uh, uh, and I I I, th I mean it, it was a very short experiment because it, I was there just for two years uh, <clears throat> until basically um, I was accused of uh, plagiarizing the document that that uh, I prepared um, with the help of some students uh, for the Venice Biennale for mm -hmm. Rems. Uh, Venice Biennale. Now plagiarism is very fashionable <laughs> in the in the American academia. <clears throat> but uh, <clears throat> what happened basically was that I uh, I hired a few assistants to be part of that uh, project, and one of them was a PhD. I mean, I I hired two PhDs, and then some people from the masters who were doing most of the research. 
<clears throat> and then the the one of the PhDs was actually working hard and contributing, and the other one was doing nothing. Uh, so I told the, the one that was, I basically fired the, the, the woman that was doing nothing. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and, but the guy who was actually engaged and contributing uh, used that moment in some, somehow he, he tried to kind of um, take over the, the project or take over. And I basically, I was very hard. I said, no, this is, this is not my project. The project is this. Please mm-hmm. stick to this. And then it was kind of, it went on and on. And it, it basically, then he started doing nothing until I basically also fired him. I, I, and then what he did was, uh, he, because I was, I was composing the document by <clears throat> commissioning different students to do parts of the, so I would say, you're going to do the curtain wall uh, and you're going to do the ifs and you're going to, so basically I was assigning to different people sure. different parts of the project. And uh, I, I had, I had never cared about plagiarism very much. I, when I write, I don't, I don't copy other people's stuff. Right. <laughs> uh, but it uh, turns out that uh, that uh, some of the, my assistants had copied, like, uh, I don't know, some two sentences of the description of ETFE from Wikipedia or whatever. Like, you know, if you get, <clears throat> if you <clears throat> become, like, really strict about these kind of things, then you find that there were instances a few instances. I mean, I've published uh, even the instances and everything, and I explained the, the, the situation. But I obviously didn't check that everybody who was submitting one of these texts uh, to the project was uh, was not. I mean, I, well, I mean, the, 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 I mean, I think the, the other the other problem was that speaking to Rem, Rem was very skeptical about being too academic sure well this is for uh, the biennale this is not for a, the biennale. yeah 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 for the biennale but but i mean that was what created the the the, the fact that i had to step down as a as a as i see oh. yeah because basically i i engaged with uh, with rem and i agreed with him and i said look we we are not going to do an academic document we are going to do something that is much more <clears throat> address to the general public mm-hmm. and we are not going to, I mean, the decision was that we were not going to have any citations. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So my instruction to the students, it was like, we, I discussed it with Ren. We both agree that, uh, that this should not be a kind of academic paper. It should be more like a kind of explanation where you don't have to resort to other uh, sources to understand whatever. And obviously when you do that, you have to make sure that whatever is written there is not paraphrasing work that other people have, but not really other people, but, uh, but uh, even like descriptions of, um, of a technology or things like that, that appear in a book or something like that. So mm-hmm. what happened was that <clears throat> there were 12 instances of, I mean, I, I can send them to you. It's the kind of, if you read them, they are ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. <clears throat> but what happened was that the guy who was begrudged because I fired him, and who was the PhD who was supposed supposed to make sure that the the, the document was uh, was correct academically speaking, instead of correcting the 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 work from his colleagues and say okay this is plagiarizing this or that uh, he basically made a document and and collected all these things and made a claim to the university that the the my in uh, uh, my kind of contribution to the biennale was plagiarizing because obviously he had recorded the, yes. the, wow. the instances of plagiarism from, from his own colleagues. Right. Uh, uh, but the time they were one document that I was responsible for, and I've never, um, uh, you know, denied responsibility. I was 
the final, I mean, they had a credit, but obviously I was responsible sure. for it. Yeah. But I didn't, I didn't make sure that, yeah. that all the text didn't, uh, or had rewritten the, the references so that you cannot say that there were uh, a sentence that is, they were literally sentences. Okay. It's not, it's not, I mean, if uh-huh. you've been following the clouding gay, uh, 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 event, you know, there are whole paragraphs that she was uh, yeah. plagiarizing, but this is literally like one sentence of a book describing ETFE or something like that, which you can find exactly the same, the same thing in Wikipedia and six other sources. Yeah, and and on top of that, this was not a kind of peer reviewed. Yeah. Um, yeah. A situation. It was yeah. like a, like a, like a catalog for a for a work of public information. So uh, anyway, I'm, I that was basically that was what <clears throat> particularly two members of the faculty went to the administration and supported the guy. So <laughs> d- uh, so um, y- yeah, we'll have to get those. We'll probably put those yeah. on the screen during the recording, but. Uh, I, I understand what you're saying, and it's a very different thing. I, I'm not an academic. I used to teach off and on, but I, I've never done research in that space. Yeah. I understand it's very strict, and there's peer reviews and all those things. But I also yeah. understand that there's a pretty big distinction between that space versus my understanding is like doing a description that's meant to be accessible for the public. So, and yeah. And what's interesting, too, is that I think when someone says X person plagiarized, Hmm. that's not exact as you as you've described that's not exactly the full nuanced story as to what happened that's a very easy way to paint a clear picture that sounds like it's red and intense and horrific but yeah, it's yeah. not <laughs> but it doesn't say but it's not what you're describing which yeah. is interesting no. right no. but no, so I was mean, that was that used would you think that was just used as an excuse to then have you step down Exactly. I mean, that, that's what I'm saying, that once this guy started talking to certain members of the faculty, all these guys went up to the administration and say, oh, yeah, 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 uh, this yeah. guy, whatever, is not a, is not a real academic and is basically uh, <laughs> breaching the ba- most basic rules and, and so on and so forth. So that's basically what, what uh, they used to, to kind of get me out of the, of the, of the deanship. But then after that, you you stayed at Princeton and you and you were a faculty member for the next six or so years. Yeah, so that, were you teaching studio? I was I was teaching I was uh, teaching studio and I was I mean I had a normal uh, load. That, I mean uh, Princeton Princeton is a very academic place. Yeah. So you are not allowed to basically um, teach a part time. Oh. Okay. You have to teach. I mean, some people have that, that uh, possibility, but basically they don't like it. They they want you to teach full time always. Okay. And so that requires you to teach three courses. And in the school of architecture, is one studio which counts for several credits and two seminars. And, and basically, I was teaching regularly one studio and two seminars. Are you requ- they- are teachers at, at at Princeton at that time were they required to also be doing their own research in addition to those? Uh, yes, but 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 uh, you know, uh, as uh, happens also in in all schools of of architecture, in most schools of architecture, the people who are assigned to the design department, like I was, I was a design. I mean, I was not in history and theory, right? And I was not in technology. Gotcha. Uh, I was a design professor. Gotcha. And so the design professors do research by maybe practicing or entering competitions. Right. I mean, gotcha. like, like you don't have, uh, you know, you're not specializing or, on air movement or mm-hmm. thermal transmission, and you are not specializing in history of the, the 20th architecture of the 20th century. Mm-hmm. So design is a much more, much more difficult thing to, to, classify and that's basically why um why um it's more difficult for uh for the university to to see whether you are investigating investigating design so for example the biennale thing was perfect because it was a way of saying there is some level of 
intelligence that is being created or research that is being published uh, and is about <coughs> design, architectural design. Or so you get engaged in shows or or, or other things that uh, that count in a way as um, as uh, your research. Yes. Okay. I understand. Well, um, after you stepped down as dean, it was seems like it was pretty clear to you and a lot of people that this, the f there was going to be friction, probably continued friction. Did you ever think to yourself, I'm just going to leave entirely? Like, I'm not going to stick around and teach in, in this space. I'm, I'm just going to just leave. What, that why I didn't do it. Yeah, uh, yeah, because, yeah. Because I, I, well, you know, by by the time I had moved to the states, I was <clears throat> living there. They were they were paying me very well for doing work that I enjoyed doing because nobody meddled with uh, my seminars and my hmm. studio, so I could basically use these vehicles to uh, to develop knowledge. I mean, I. I <clears throat> I did a book on on facades out of the research that I was doing there, and I was preparing another one of the on the Posthuman City on on another seminar, and the studio was uh, I mean the courses were were very successful. I, I would say that probably my studio <coughs> was the most <coughs> successful in terms of number of uh, people wanting to enter the studio and things like that during mm -hmm. this time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I, the friction, and, and so that was fine. You know, I was, I was doing that. Um, I was not involved at all with the other activities. But you know, as a professor, you don't need to right. necessarily go to all the. I mean, you have to go sometimes to juries, and you have to do, do certain things. But but you are free to. I mean, you don't need to be. Uh, uh, plus, I mean, there are some people in in Princeton that are very good and i had a very good and to this day i have a very good relationship with mm -hmm. <clears throat> but uh, not with others sure but as long as they don't bother you yeah who cares yeah because no, you're a teacher you're not you're not you don't have to play yeah. in the political space yeah. as much uh, exactly exactly you are you are tenured you 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 dis decide what your courses are nobody but but there was one thing that was was basically what uh created the the conflict that basically got me fired, which is that for since 2008, so even before I, I went there, <clears throat> um, Liz Diller was what was called co thesis coordinator. Okay. Uh, and that meant, I mean, that was something that Stan Allen gave her to give her some prerogative, etc., and get her to go more often to the school, etc. But it it basically meant that, that she was coordinating and discussing with all the physics students, and and in exchange for that, she had to do no other courses, which is incredibly strange in Princeton because in, in Princeton, as Liz I said, it's yeah, very academic. Right. You are yeah. supposed to do three courses, but Liz was doing like <clears throat> thesis, and that was it. Because okay. Liz is not an academic either. I mean, Liz cannot teach a seminar. Yeah, no, she has a practice in New York exactly, City. Exactly. But it's you know exactly. So so basically, um, uh, it was always very problematic because then she started uh, deciding on some sort of year theme. So she would say, "Okay, this year we are gonna do fat, and the next year we are gonna do." revolution or revolution and i i uh, when i stepped down i basically had to teach some thesis and i thought what the fuck is this i mean i am a tenure professor and i'm in charge of directing uh, uh, the, the thesis of a number of students every year and i have to do what uh, liz Wheeler decides to do per, uh, every year and i said no i'm not gonna do it mm -hmm. i mean there, there were other things that were like <clears throat> the the students would get totally confused because the way I teach is entirely different from the way this teaches. And, you know, I respect what she does, uh, but I want also respect for what I do. And sure. I don't want anybody telling my students the opposite of what I'm saying on yeah. a weekly yeah. basis. Yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah. That, that created constant conflict of... Uh, uh, 
of advice. Yeah, and, so, and, and systematically, my students would get deviated and yeah. would end up nowhere. And then at some point I said, I'm sorry, but I'm not putting up with this. This is, this is impinging in, into my academic freedom and I, I don't want to do it. So the, the thesis coordinator position, um, is that person, Liz Diller, are they actually, do they have their own set of, I don't know, 10 students, whatever number of students under her, or is it just the umbrella position of coordinator that sets the, uh, the, it's, the, it's, the umbre- it's the umbrella position. Okay. Uh, but but then, then maybe she would teach, she would direct maybe two or three people that, of, of course, they were the ones that she like chose yeah sure so there was some sort of kind of uh also um, I, I i i thought a kind of corrupt way of assigning students to uh whoever uh, um you um wanted to uh so i mean the, the, there was a and and the worst thing is also that in the transcripts of the students and in the records of the graduate school Every other design professor was was basically formally in charge of certain theses, but the grade of the thesis would go to Lee's course because that was the only thing that I mean if 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 she had not uh, if the grades on the students were not of the students' thesis were not put next to her name, she would basically had no grades and no students. Mm. And so, I mean, the, the, the whole thing was corrupt. I mean, like, uh, that the word is corrupt. And, and then basically I said, you know, you, if you want to continue doing, doing it like this, you, you do, but please do not, don't, do not engage me on, on, on this uh, thesis system because it's against my academic freedom. So how many thesis teachers were there underneath the, uh, you know, in total? All, all the design pro, uh, faculty was uh, not to do thesis. Okay. So that means Stan Allen, Jesse Reiser, mm. uh, Paul Lewis, mm. uh, and and some other. I mean, not not that many actually, because the school is very small. Yeah. Mario yeah. Gandelsonas, um, I don't know, six or seven people. Gotcha, gotcha. And everyone operates underneath this chosen uh, subject yes. or topic or direction. Yes, and I and you know the the kind of conflicting advice was something that everybody hated, but some people didn't say anything. Or, sure, and, sure. Yeah, and then <clears throat> there was no conflict, but they would just put up with it. Well, everyone uh, knows. I mean, everyone's been in a position where you get two different uh, directions from the folks above you, whether they be employers or teachers. Like I've co-taught a course in architecture before it went well, but even if you know that other teacher really well and your best friends and you, and you respect each other, there's going to be problems. Even if you Except, are in a line and if you're not in a line, well, there's a shit show. Like there's no, did, there's no you, way it's not going to be. Then you shouldn't be using the student as the medium to get through those types of conversation. Like the student exactly, is exactly. There, that was, you know, that, that was, I mean, the, 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 the things that, I mean, the, the, my fault for which I was dismissed was uh, that I wrote a letter to students. I, I said, sorry, but, you know, I recommend you not to choose me as, as uh, I had a lot of people wanting to do thesis with me. I'm like, like, you know, from the, from the post-professional degree, like mm-hmm. 45% of the, of the students wanted to do thesis with me. Yeah, and I, I, I send I send a letter and I said, um, you know, in your own interest, do not choose me because you are <laughs> going to do, do not put me as one of your choices because if you put me as one of your choices, you are going to be assigned to me, and and that's going to jeopardize your thesis. And also, I didn't want anybody to decide what the subject of your thesis is, you have to decide the, sub- the subject of, of your thesis because thesis is by default an independent work. Yeah, well, so that's, I, that's, the, that's, that's the weird thing about it. You know, the, the whole political issues that, that occurred and all that other stuff aside, just talking about objectively the how one decides to run a school or a thesis program, you know, like I said, my master's in, is in urban design. It's not in architecture. So I didn't do an architectural graduate level thesis but from my understanding is the point of thesis is for you as an individual to find out 
That's right. What, and to explore your yeah. interests, That's which right. then affects the rest of your career oftentimes. Exactly. Exactly. But, but uh, you know, the, the, she was treating the students as, as if they were a herd of uh, sheep, basically. And say, <laughs> okay. okay, this year we're going to, the, the students and the, and the professors, because, you know, the fact that somebody is telling you students assigned, formally assigned, what, what is their subject is, uh, is ridiculous. It's a kind of total violation of academic freedom. At that level in particular. Yeah. Yeah. So, so basically, so, I, I, and what, what was even more amazing is that then the thing went to Monica, the dean, the new dean, Monica Monfer Leon, who uh, mm -hmm. supported it. And then <clears throat> I said, this is bullshit. And then the, the thing went to, went to the dean of the faculty and so on. I mean, basically, it's like a kebab, no? Every single <laughs> layer of the, of the university administration is involved and is corrupt. And I've published it. I mean, I don't know whether you've seen the videos and you've seen the, you've uh, accessed the the folder with all the correspondence. But uh, it, it, it's 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 corrupt because you disagree with their approach, or it's corrupt because they are deciding to take that approach for ulterior reasons. Well, the the real reasons for the system is to legitimize a position that should not exist. The thesis coordinator. Is, exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, a thesis coordinator is a secretary who assigns this to that or, or sees who wants what and tries to do a lottery so that people get assigned to the right people yeah. and they fly with it. Mm -hmm. Why is somebody uh, in charge of supervising what you are supervising? I mean, it, it doesn't exist, in, uh, in my knowledge, it doesn't exist anywhere in the world. The only reason why it existed there was because for, for Liz it was great. <clears throat> Normally she would have had to be in the school at least three days a week mm. as a full-time professor, and she could do it in, in one afternoon a week. Right. So right. it was very, and, and, then, and then she could exert some sort of ideological control on all the theses coming out of the school, which is kind of a stupid control to to, yeah. to have, but but so what is amazing is that you know people put up with it. You know, senior professors of Princeton University put up with somebody telling you students what the thesis the subject every year is, and and somebody is supervising the thesis that you are making with your students and 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 telling them what to do. So I, I had uh, students and I said, well, what did you do? Oh, Liz told me to do this. I said, well, you should not have done it. Oh, but Liz grades because she was also in charge of grading. So, I mean, if that is the, the point, that this is when I wrote a, a letter, a public letter to the students, I say, please do not put my name because in this system, I consider yeah. that this is a violation of my academic freedom and is, is going to jeopardize because I'm going, I'm going to tell you exactly the opposite of Liz. So you're going to be, um, you're going to find yourself in a kind of conflict of advice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you don't want that for your thesis. Uh, this thesis is probably hard enough. I don't think anyone yeah, needs another exactly. layer of confusion exactly. for sure. Exactly. Um, especially, you know, also let's consider that the, the two of you and all of the, all the names you're mentioning, these are heavy hitters. I know all the names you've mentioned, which is not to, yeah. to say that I know a lot of people. It's to say that these are very important people. So, um, well, let's say people with a certain name in the, in yeah. the profession. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And then you, I, I mean, if we are that important, but <laughs> well, <laughs> wait, sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, so so this all leads to 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 additional friction the, the where things get weird and then and then you get let go I, because of that but the other part that gets weird no, I get fired not let go I get fired. <laughs> you get fired okay <laughs> good on you um uh, the other thing that's weird with all this though is that this all seems to be a result of which again just a a fervent misalignment between how to teach and how things should be run how does the topics of cancel culture, affirmative action, like all this other stuff, which is not, hasn't really been discussed yet and doesn't seem to be at all objectively part of what happened. How does that get folded yeah. into the story? Well, it, it gets, do you know why Liz is allowed to do this? To basically 
she's given a, a, a job where she can basically muscle into the thesis of of everybody my guess my guess would be if, because she's a big name in New York City and she does their office has great work and the school wants to be associated with someone like that correct and also because she is a female is she is the female um, not so young but kind of young right or emerging architect in America she definitely is that yes uh, okay. not, not so, so much but, but yes how, yes I know what you're saying how, how many how many other women do you know in her position in America I'm horrible with memory so I, <laughs> people are gonna hate me for this um, but well, but there, not, not at that there tier are not, there are not many there are not many if there they may be others but there are not many yeah and they are very valuable assets for a university that is trying to promote women not only that but her practice i i mean i've i've written a book that actually i can send it to you mm. um it's not published yet i mean it's published in spanish but it's not published in, in the english version and, and actually last month i fell out with the, the editor that was going to to publish so i'm now looking again for an editor but <clears throat> but um uh my theory is is well i i think one of the the i i you know i i don't i don't dislike Liz's work it's not it's not a kind of negation of her work or her capacity or or things like that but uh i think Gilles scofidio is Gilles scofidio and renfro are the perfect embodiment of the kind of woke um spirit because it's an office made by a black man, a Jewish woman, mm -hmm. and a gay guy. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so every form of difference is embodied in the practice. And, and mm -hmm. I think that is one of the reasons for their success, because they were some of the earlier people who realized that there was potential in exploiting this kind of identity um uh, politics mm -hmm. to uh, thrive. Um, mm -hmm. So that what does it mean that that you get selected for competitions because you are black and you are female and you are gay and all these things these days matter because of sure. the whole affirmative action um, uh, situation, which. Back then, I I was you know I thought that, that there needs to be a certain affirmative action. I now think it shouldn't. I think that things should not really? be based on 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 identity ever. But mm. I mean, like that has been also a, a certain radicalization on on my part. Mm. <clears throat> um, so that 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 was part of uh, part of it and then um so one thing was the 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 question of i mean during and, and monica ponce de leon was is very much uh, an agent of uh, of that world because you know she's a female latin and she's been I mean, people who know her her career will tell you that she basically has exploited that uh, throughout her her career, and now she's. I mean, during the time, um, the six years I I was uh, I was there under under her her uh, uh, command, um, uh, she hired nine people that were. Um, that was basically, but at the time when she uh, she took over the school, there were fourteen members of the faculty, thirteen or fourteen, I can't remember very well. Mm -hmm. So she hired nine new okay. ones, not a single white male. Okay, <laughs> three um, tran uh, uh, trans trans uh, people. So mm -hmm. three of them are trans people. There are three black people. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, th there was a kind of deliberate constantly through through that period. There was a, and then she fired two 
white males. Me mm -hmm. and an accent, uh, I mean, another guy was uh, actually very accent Killian was not promoted, so he had to leave basically. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that there has been uh, a deliberate uh, attempt to, um, there was a deliberate attempt on her side <clears throat> to say that, uh, I mean, there is correspondence uh, when over the whole affair um, where where Silvia Levin mm. is cited in a, in an email from Monica Ponce de Leon to the uh, dean of the faculty when she, she says that the reason why I am opposing the thesis and making a fuss about the thesis is because they are female. And I am, I mean, so the thesis is being discussed with the higher administration in the university um, using the fact that I am a white male and that they are females and therefore I reject their imposition right. uh, as coordinators because of that. So okay. I, 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 I want to ask like um, just more subjectively, like how does that make you feel when I'm sure your position is that I, that you disagree with it, but it has nothing to do with one's uh, identity. Per, identity. That, sorry, I don't understand the question very well. Uh, my Can question you, is, how does that make you feel when someone says that you take this position because of someone's identity when it seems to be that your opposition to the thesis and how it was run actually just has to do with just an academic position of, of how... Do you know what I, I mean? Like, I mean, obviously, it really makes me very angry. But it, like, uh, and this is why I'm now in some ways radicalized radicalizing against anything that smells of identity mm -hmm. because I, I and you know i'm in a way i'm enjoying the whole uh clothing gay and and the congressional uh, investigation because because that has shown where does the the whole exploitation of uh, of identity politics takes us yeah Finally, yeah. to to a, to a university where the merit and the and the the excellence has been replaced by having to hire people from certain identities because of they, their identity, not because they have merit or because they do interesting research or because they are incredibly competent, but purely and simply because they are black, female, gay, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and this is why, you know, at some point I was, I, I, I thought uh, <clears throat> that uh, that um, affirmative action is good because mm -hmm. because it's true. Maybe we should try to incorporate uh, more women into the profession and so on and so forth. And <clears throat> and I think that has been has been uh, a good process. <laughs> That has been has been productive and and uh, but it has been taken to a point like the one the the thing I I said which is that the school in in six years hires nine people and there is not a single white male and and there are three um, trans people out of so the percentages that that. Uh, that right. this is taking show that this cannot be based on excellence. It is impossible that out of the population right. in the U.S. there is um, the, the representation of the different populations or the, the different identities is certainly not what the hires are 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 being produced. And and then you know basically how internally people say, oh, but you know. Uh, she's a woman or she's a black woman and therefore um, so one of the things that that i denounced pu publicly although it didn't really have much to do with uh, with my specific process is that one of the things that monica did was to hire make a short list of exclusively black people okay that's illegal directly mm -hmm. it's against the constitution you cannot exclude races in in a in a certain job although you know you you i i keep 
seeing you know, on Twitter people who who show positions that are announced only for black people or only for women or only for, but that's illegal. Uh, so it's, it's, it's plainly off the menu. Right. And during during uh, Ponce de Leon's uh, deanship, there was a process in which three black professors were offered positions out of a list of only black professors by design. I mean, I remember I went one day to the to the one faculty meeting, and then Monica said, "Oh, uh, please give me names of black candidates that we can hire." And then there was a list in which no no Asians, no natives, no Latins were considered at all or called. It was a list made for black professors. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I because I I was affected by another side of the politics of identity, which is the kind of male female. Mm-hmm. I think I I denounced that publicly, mm-hmm. and and one of the black women with whom I had actually a, quite a good relationship before I I used to invite her to to juries <clears throat> and things like that <clears throat> came out saying that I was a white supremacist. Oh, Mitch, public, public, yeah, publicly. So the uh, there's. Uh... This is sort of a joke, but not a joke, but also a, a, my first thought, I just have to say, right or wrong, is what's an odd thing is that as an American, I would not think of you as a white guy. <laughs> because when I think of a white guy, I mean, I mean, maybe it's worth talking about, maybe not. I have no idea. But as a, I think of like, you know, the Heinz 57, a, a, a white American, American who's white? just a mix yeah. of European stuff. But you're yeah. Spanish, right? I mean... I mean, yeah, not that this really contributes Spain to the conversation, Spain's, but like, <laughs> I don't think he was no, a no, white guy. No, no, but le- legally, you know, uh, as a Spaniard, you don't qualify as minority in the States. Oh, really? Oh, interesting. No. Okay. Oh. No, no, I'm basically, I'm a white European. Okay. By, I mean, like, uh, Spaniards are white Europeans in the American. Right. So if you have to tick boxes, you yeah. cannot tick. Hispanic is a different thing. Sure, Monica, sure. Monica is Hispanic or Latin or or no, they call Latin, right? They don't call yeah, it right. Yeah, yeah Latinx. Latinx. So, yeah. So la, la, Latins are people from South America, but not Spanish from Spain. Well, that's we just are, my own. Are, <laughs> I, I just categorize everyone from Europe who's like born in Europe tan, that they're you're they, not white. Even if you're <laughs> even if you're as pale as a white um, wall and you're from Europe, I don't think of you as white in the context of the United States. But that's a you know, different conversation. Um, no. it, it, was there ever a moment during all of this uh, where you just thought to yourself, again, I'm just going to step away. I'm not going to engage in in this territory uh, mm-hmm. because it's not going to lead anywhere you know, mentally healthy or maybe even productive. Like just, I'm good. I'm just going to do my own thing and you, you do whatever you're going to do at Princeton. Oh yeah. Yeah. But I, I, this is what I did after I stepped down. I basically said, okay, you know, the school is going to go down the drain uh, because I mean, I knew Monica um, because she was at Harvard when I was at Harvard and um, I knew what she was going to do. And, uh, and I said, well, I'm just going to teach my courses and get out as soon as possible. And I did that, but there was one thing where, where there was somebody who was, I mean, the thesis was basically what triggered the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because there was no way uh, that I could, could uh, escape that uh, unless the school recognized that I had independence. And if one student was assigned to me, I was responsible for it and I could decide what to do, and I didn't want anybody else, particularly Liz, to, to give him or her instructions on, gotcha. on, on how yeah. to run the, the thesis. So the, there was something in the system that was <clears throat> fundamentally uh, unacceptable uh, uh, in terms of <clears throat> academic freedom. And that basically was what triggered the whole, the whole fuss. So, but what is most amazing is that the yeah. whole university structure of a very, you know, university that is very important and very sophisticated, the whole 
uh, academic structure supported that. Well, that's that's where. Yeah, yeah, but that's, that's, that's where the, the word corrupt maybe yeah, starts to come into say, play. That's where you know, like, if you again, I mean, coming from a foreign perspective, right? Like, if you look at schools in, let's say, Europe, France, Italy, Spain, and school yeah. in the U.S., I mean, here it's a business, and the whole politics that run through schools and and hierarchy and the games that you have to play and and it's all yeah. about the tuition that the students pay. It's not so mm. much about the quality of the education you get. Sometimes it's much more about. How things look you like, guys must have know. politics in France, though. I'm sure there is, that. and and you know there are probably like way worse of attitudes between <laughs> people because they're not as nice as Americans among themselves. But it's the French are the the, the, <laughs> the most anti woke. Oh yeah, oh, yeah, <laughs> you know. oh, yeah, you know. Well, is it but, interesting? So a lot of these uh, kind of but, woke cancel culture topics are, are a lot of times pretty specific to the United States. Yes, it yeah. it it. It, it kind of radiates from the U.S. Yeah, <clears throat> I, because because of the kind of uh, Christian. I mm. mean, there are there are. I'll send you the book because it, it, I, I theorize the whole the whole scene. Yeah, and uh, there is an anthropologist called Beth. Ah, I can't remember now. Who in the, well, I mean, there's this anthropologist, she's in the book, is uh, and she is, um, she studied actually Japanese culture, and she studied what, what uh, she calls the culture of the guilt versus the culture of shame. And so all Asian cultures are cultures of shame. So you, if you mm. do something, and these are kind of mechanisms of, of social control. So mm. in Asia, if you do something wrong, as long as nobody finds out, you are fine. But if people find out, right, yeah, you are you are ashamed and you are gone. Right, basically, they they will they will make you feel the shame for the rest of your life, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's it's people that control. When somebody does something wrong, they are shaming this this person and his whole family and God, whatever. Yep. Uh, in the Western cultures, she says, um, um, God, I can't remember her name, Ruth, Jewish anthropologist. Uh, the book is, the book is called the, the Chrysanthemum and the Sword. <clears throat> anyway, so, um, she says the the Western cultures are what what is she calls the cultures of the the culture of guilt, which means that people are controlled by themselves. So you are trained to feel guilty when you do something wrong on a very deep level. Mm -hmm. So it's not mm. it's not people don't need to find out that you're doing something wrong because you've been taught. Um, to feel guilty, right? Yeah. And so that kind of guilt, <clears throat> guiltiness, is basically what generates the whole, the whole um, politically correct woke, hmm. uh, uh, which some people exploit. So, Monica Ponce de Leon, for example, um, she was the partner of Nader Terani, and and right. basically when they, when they split up, they had an agreement that gave her. 51% of the company, not because she worked more or she put money in the company, but because if they had, if she had the uh, 51%, she could, the company could qualify as a female owned, owned company yeah. Yeah. and yeah, therefore the, get some advantages. The, the strange now, thing. Happens, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, what happened was that when they split up, basically she fired him and, and locked the door and, and she said she had the right to do it and locked him out yep. of the server. Right. She had the right to do it because she was the majority owner by 1%, knowing yep. that that was something that they established in order to. So that is a kind of shameless use of affirmative action yeah. to gain undue advantage. 
So okay. uh, that, that's the caliber of people that we are talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So in if it were to up to you, your position as of now is that there would not be any affirmative action, any lens, any part of, of, of one's identity is a factor in terms of who to hire, who to work with, who gets the project, all that stuff. It's just objectively, the, I say the work. Correct, correct. Yeah. I, I, ca- I came to the conclusion that this is the, <clears throat> in this world now, this is the most, um, the most um, uh, effective and the most fair <laughs> way of, um, of uh, organizing society. And mm. uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, it may not be uh, entirely perfect, but it's much better uh, than a society that is organized based on on identity traits. I think the, the identity, I mean, particularly America has always been uh, a, a, a place where different cultures, the different races have merged. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't think that um, America is structurally racist as as uh, you know, Ibrahim mm. Kendi and all the kind of white supremacist, uh, uh, white uh, black activists are uh, are pretending. Mm. And you can you can look at it in the statistics. You know, the people that earn more money in the U.S. are the American Indians, and then the American Chinese, or the American Koreans, or the American Japanese. Mm. Those are the people that are making more money on average. In, in in the US there are statistics that you can that you can read the whites are after that mm-hmm. and then the the latins and then the blacks mm-hmm. so uh, if america was structurally racist the the highest earning groups on average would not be asian for example it's interesting because when you use the you know term structurally racist, the first ethnic group that comes to mind for me personally, and probably most people, are black communities. Sure. Uh, this was an odd thing because I am Asian, but I don't think of about Asians and <laughs> even Native Americans, which is horrible. The first, the first thing is that comes to mind for most people is probably the black community. Yeah, the the, the black community is obviously the victims, and when we talk about you know. The whole woke scene, you have oppressors and oppressed and, and now, and the blacks are always the oppressed. Yeah. But, but I, I, I believe, I don't believe that this is, that this is, uh, that this is a kind of, uh, real structural oppression. It, it, it relates to certain qualities of the black, uh, community hmm. in terms of, you know, stability of the family or um, IQ. I mean, the, there is a huge debate now about IQ, and it's proven that basically Asians are smarter than than whites and than, <laughs> than black. I mean, this is this is kind of a scientific. Well, right. this, this, the same way that you can say that the the NFL uh, blacks are overrepresented or that there are no no kind of um uh, not a lot of Asians in the NFL that's for sure yeah exactly Too how small. many how many Asians have you seen in the NFL that's an, the many, sports analogy is an interesting how, one how many how many Jews i mean there is no question that 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 uh, that different ethnic groups have certain capacities physical or cognitive that affect their performance in different fields. And I don't think that the American society is particularly <clears throat> uh, against one of these groups, because in America, whoever offers the best product wins, because sells more and, and so on <laughs> and so forth. So, so I, I don't think that, uh, that this whole discussion about um, structural racism or structural sex- sexism um, in respect to gays and, and so on and so forth is believable anymore. Hmm. Uh, <clears throat> uh, 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 and and also, I don't see why this has to be involved in shaping um, an, uh, academia or in shaping the uh, department's 
um, composition. The same way that race is not is not relevant when when you are shaping um, a, a, a basketball team. Mm. Mm. You just it, get the best people and full yeah. stop. And whatever the, the the mix is, that's it. Interesting. We have to continue this conversation. I wish yeah. we had another hour booked because I, yeah. I have yeah. I have thoughts on this, but but I, I don't want to open up the, <laughs> yeah. the 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 conversation. We have two minutes left. The one question we do have to ask, and you only have like a minute to answer it, yeah. <laughs> is a, a more of a fun question: is what is your favorite building? <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> Usually we have a good five or ten minutes to discuss this, but <laughs> you're on the spot now. It's impossible for me to say. You can name a few. I don't know. The, the, the Malaparte Villa is one that comes to my mind. Or, you know this one, the Curcio Malaparte Villa from Libera? No, I, I might, but uh, how did you spell that? Malaparte, M A L A P A R T. That's a that's a very interesting building for me. But the Sydney Opera House, of course, uh, the Hagia Sophia is okay. absolutely incredible. And uh, I mean the, the the things that there are so many that uh, you know. <laughs> uh, the Unité d'Habitation is uh, mm. fantastic. Those are good the, ones. Huh? Those are pretty good ones. <laughs> Those are pretty good yeah, ones. Yeah. 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 Those aren't bad. Are so many, I mean, in, 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 in the U.S., actually, there are, there are incredible buildings that are not so well-known. No, in the Marina Towers, uh, well, I mean, those are very well-known. But there, mm. there are, there are uh, the Bell Laboratories, uh, mm. for example, uh, uh, there are many, many kind of corporate buildings that are not so, so <laughs> well known. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that it's like if you go back in history, then then you know the Colosseum. <laughs> it's, it's too many. It's, 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 okay. a, it's an it's an impossible. <laughs> I, I, I think that I mean this is like is. Like when somebody asks you what is your favorite song, and, and you know it depends on your mood. It depends yeah, yeah. on sure, sure, sure. <laughs> well, let's do this. We'll, we'll have you on again. We'll, we'll continue the conversation, and then we can talk about favorite buildings more extensively. Um, but Alejandro, thank you so much for making the time. This was very interesting. We appreciate um, you obviously being open to talk about all the stuff and your time. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to you. Thank you, everybody, for listening to this week's episode. If you like what we're doing and you want to support the show, then the best way to do that is to leave a review of the show in the Apple... Po- what? I was going to say, the best way is just to send us a million dollars. <laughs> okay. Okay. Into my bank account. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> true. If you have a million dollars to spare, then let us you know. support a little podcast? Um, or... That would support the podcast for quite some time, I think. Yeah. Um, can retire. <laughs> no. No. Uh what else what was I going to say? Oh, yes. Reviews on Spotify, YouTube. You can follow us on Instagram. We have like 80,000 followers now. So there's a good community of folks. So if you have thoughts, feel free to share your thoughts on Instagram. Yeah, get the conversation going. If you want to reach out to us directly, you can do so by visiting our website, com. Everything is on there. Or you can send us a message or leave a voicemail to our hotline, 213-222-6950. That's one of the best ways to reach us. And uh, yeah, a lot more to come, a lot of great guests scheduled for this year, and a lot more exciting topics. Yes, yes, yes. And I hope everyone found this interview um, insightful and interesting. And as you said at the intro, um, I know that we, I and we both appreciated his openness to talk about things. I think it's interesting, now this is another conversation, but I think that it's one of the challenges with the topics that was covered is that um, they're very inflammatory, right? Yeah, and um, whether or not you agree with his with what he says, I think he is certainly trying to be as objective as possible when talking about things, and uh, that's appreciated. Yeah, very much so. All right, talk soon, people. <laughs> bye. Bye. Bye.